All right. Good morning, everyone. It is 834 um, and the Texas Early Learning Council meeting uh, is coming to order. Uh, I'm Reagan Miller. I am the director of child care and early learning at the Texas Workforce Commission and also the chair of the Texas Early Learning Council. Um, so I want to welcome all of our council members. Um, agency staff, and of course the public who are joining us today. Um, this meeting is a Zoom meeting and council members, presenters, and agency staff are participating as speakers while members of the public are able to participate in a listen-only mode. So a reminder to all of our members, uh, keep your electronic devices, devices on mute when you're not speaking and remember to state your name um, the first time you speak. Because today's meeting is focused on our strategic planning efforts, it's going to be facilitated by the team at the Texas Institute for Child and Family Wellbeing, who are leading the strategic plan development for the preschool development grant. Uh, to effectively engage with each other, there will be some smaller group breakouts with a subset of council members interspersed throughout each of these breakout meetings. Uh, and before we turn to strategic planning, I'm going to ask Megan Schneider, our interagency director for early childhood support, to conduct a roll call vote and then to facilitate our public comment um, portion of the meeting. So Megan, over to you. All right, can y'all hear me okay? And if any members I of the public want to submit public comment, you still have a chance, look in the chat for instructions. All right, thank you, Reagan. I'm Megan Schneider. Um, I'm the partial meeting facilitator uh, just for this roll call portion and the public comment. Today's roll call council members is a little bit different than normal because we aren't approving any minutes. So when I call your name, please just reply present or here to reflect um, that you are here. So Catherine Abba. Sarah Abrahams. Present. Weldon Beard. Terry Breeden. I know I see Terry, so I'm going to give you the chance to unmute there. Unmute. Um, there. There we go. It wouldn't unmute. There you go. There he is here. present. Thank you, Terry. April Crawford. Present. Rochelle Daniel. Present. Alferma Giles. Present. Good morning. Melissa Hoisington. Becky Huskeeler. Here. Kim Coffrin. Good morning, present. Corey Lee. Present. Jerlitha McDonald. Present. Reagan Miller. I am here. Maricela Nava. Megan, she came off mute. Marcella, we just couldn't hear you. Marcella, are you able to unmute now? You can just say present or here. She was unmuted, but we Marcella, we can't hear you when you're unmuted. All right, we will come back around. I know she's there. Uh, Stephanie Rubin, Amber Scanlon, Kirsten Schwab, present, June Yateman, present, Audrey Young,
All right. And let's come back around. I know I see Maricela, but just for the sake of the transcript or the meeting recording, Maricela Nava. All right. Uh, well, regardless, I know you're here, so we'll figure out your muting and unmuting. Um, we do have a quorum, and I will pass it back to you, Reagan. All right. Um, so the next um, agenda item is public comment, as we do in all of our posted meetings. Megan, did we have anybody submit a written public comment? We did not have any, we didn't have any last minute requests um, just in the start of this meeting. So no public comment today, but as a reminder for the public, all of our meetings are posted at, um, at the Texas Early Learning Council website. And you are able to, um, to register for public comment at any point leading up to the meeting. So I'll pass it back to you, Reagan. Perfect, all right. So that takes us to the agenda topic for today, which is the Preschool Development Grant Birth to Five Strategic Plan. So as all of you know, Texas was awarded $16 million per year for a three-year PDG grant for early childhood system building. Um, at our Friday, June 30th council meeting, we heard the first of four needs assessment presentations on the initial findings um, that Dr. Mantell and her team did. And today we're gonna to begin the work on strategic planning. Uh, this is gonna be led by Kate Mackerley and the Texas Institute for, Child, for Child and Family Wellbeing. Um, as a reminder, the full schedule of the needs assessment presentations and the strategic planning for members is available on the Texas Early Learning Council website. So I'm going to hand over the meeting to Kate who will be facilitating all of our strategic planning efforts today. So Kate, over to you. Thanks, Reagan. Welcome everybody. Bright and early on a Monday morning, no less. We really appreciate your time and for joining us this morning. My name is Kate McCurley and I'm joined with uh, three other co-facilitators. So Nicole Trevino is on the call. You'll be hearing a lot from her today. Chelsea Pfeiffer and Alex are also facilitating this meeting and making sure it runs smoothly. But we are here today for the next four hours to talk about the Texas Early Learning Strategic Plan. And so as you heard Reagan uh, already mentioned, this is a deliverable of the PDG B to five renewal grant. And so as our, your facilitators, we will be leading you through this meeting and two other meetings, and I'll get to more details about that in a minute. But let's talk about what we're gonna do today. So we have two main objectives of this meeting. First, we're gonna talk about the overall scope of this plan, and then we're gonna talk about some stakeholder engagement we might wanna do in the next few months to inform this plan. And so our meeting takes the shape of expanding on ideas and then refining them, which is sort of the delicate dance of strategic planning in general, right? And so here is a more traditional meeting agenda for you. We'll put that in the chat uh, so you could download it and follow along, know when we're gonna have a break, know what activity is coming next. But in general, we'll spend a little time this morning orienting ourselves to the process and each other. Then we'll talk about uh, the plan scope, take a little break and start talking about those uh, stakeholder engagement um, process. And so we wanted to set some parameters for this process really early on. And so let's talk about what makes an effective strategic plan. So an effective strategic plan reflects an ambitious and achievable path forward and meets the state's visions and mission. It includes measurable goals with a plan for progress monitoring and the strategies in the plan are designed to work within and build upon existing early childhood frameworks in Texas and the basic funding levels that are currently available. That being said though, of course, we can strategize past what is funded, you know, and we should think forward, but we should make sure when we do get to that strategizing, we identify which strategies might need additional resources. 
So who's involved in this strategic planning process? So we have the Early Childhood Interagency Work Group. And so these are the people who wrote the application and received the grant. So at the end of the day, they are the group that is ultimately responsible for the success of this plan's development. But that being said, the four agencies that did apply for the grant recognize their limits in scope, right? This is supposed to be a comprehensive statewide plan. And they're asking the council for their help to actually create a plan that speaks to the whole system itself. So your involvement in this, uh, these strategic planning sessions is highly valued. We really need your help to make sure that this plan actually holds itself accountable to the whole system in itself. And I also want to mention that we will be engaging workforce and family stakeholder members throughout this process to make sure that the plan is anchored in how they experience the system. So I shared this a couple of days ago. Uh, this is our strategic planning timeline. The main thing to note is that we're in our July 10th meeting and that for most of you, we got to meet with you briefly um, in the last month or so and got to hear what your thoughts were about the last strategic planning process, when, if you were involved. We asked you to take a survey about the plan itself. So we gathered a lot of feedback to make sure that these sessions really fit into the scope of what this council thinks about the strategic plan and what we need to do and accomplish. And so we have another meeting in August where we'll talk about workforce and coalition strategies. And then in October, where we'll really dive deep into strategies related to family and the data system. I also thought it would be important that you know that we very strategically plan these sessions around the needs assessment data presentation. So already today, we'll talk a little bit about what we heard on June 30th, but we're also gonna be bringing the rest of the data presentations so that we can make decisions based off the newest data available. And we'll also be bringing more data with more stakeholder engagement. And so today we'll get to determine what that might look like. And so I really want to make sure that when we do go into this strategizing, we have as much information as possible. The last thing I want to note about this timeline is that you guys are going to see the plan multiple times. We wanted to make this an iterative feedback loop. And so after this meeting, you're going to see a draft of the plan. It'll be very preliminary, but then you'll see it build out over time. And so we want to make sure you guys have multiple opportunities to provide feedback. Okay, so the Texas Early Learning System. I know you all live and breathe the Texas Early Learning System, but let's get specific about who and what we're talking about. Right, We have over 2 million children in Texas under the age of five who are served by over 95,000 workforce members who are either hired or regulated by a number of programs that are part of six state agencies, which of course are influenced by state governance, policy, standards, and regulations. That is a big system. And so it's no easy feat. And so we appreciate you all being here and creating a plan that will move this system forward. All right, back to today's meeting. Um, I know you all have been meeting for several years in some cases, but it's also important to set some guidelines because we're gonna have a, a lot of open discussion and do a lot of activities. So I wanted to go through those guidelines with you in this virtual meeting space for a couple of minutes. So I mentioned in my email a couple of days ago, this meeting is going to be highly interactive. So I'm talking a lot at the beginning just to set the scene, but you're going to be doing a lot of talking as well and participating. So we ask that you are as present as possible. Of course, life is happening during this meeting. So if you need to step away, that's totally OK. But I just wanted to give you a heads up that we do want you on camera as much as possible and ready to unmute. Suspend judgment. So. Today, we're going to get a little creative. Um, it's a necessary part of the strategic planning process. So we ask that even if we get some ideas up on a board that don't seem feasible, suspend your judgment on those and until we 
fully are able to kind of analyze and think about them and look at, at them at the span of other ideas. Churn, no speeches. So everyone on this call has a lifetime worth of expertise and has a lot of important things to say. But of course, we only have four short hours together today. So we ask you to be mindful of that and keep your comments concise. Churn kernels to rich ideas. You're going to hear a lot about churning kernels into rich ideas today. This is the idea that we need to explain the who, what, when, and why, right? And so we're going to ask you to do that a little bit today. Challenge ideas. I just mentioned suspend judgment, but I'm also asking you to challenge some ideas. Again, strategic planning is a delicate balance, a delicate dance between being accountable and being creative, right? And so we're going to ask you to bring that to this meeting today. And finally, the last three focus on the unique factors, merge ideas to create strength, narrow down to manage a few. I mentioned this idea around expanding upon ideas and then refining them. That's just an extra heads up that we are going to refine today. And sometimes that process can be a little hard, especially where I know this group is going to come up with a lot of great ideas. So I'm going to move over to Jamboard today. And so you all should have gotten this link um, about 45 about an hour ago. And if you don't have the link, feel free to message Alex Mamina. She will send it to you privately. But this is going to be our main mode of participation today. We do have a survey at some point, and I sent that link to you, but wait to take that survey at that point in the meeting. Um, so, And I wanted to give you a visual of our virtual room. I have our meeting guidelines up here. I wanted to mention there are four UT Austin meeting facilitators here today. Some of you might get to work with Chelsea and Alex in the uh, breakout rooms, but you'll be hearing a lot from Nicole and I. Um, then we have our council members. I know not everyone has been able to make it yet today, and that's okay. We hope to see them in August when we all come in person. And then I also wanna mention we have meeting observers. Welcome, thank you for coming, uh, and thank you for listening. Uh, I want to mention we have a parking lot, and some of you probably are already familiar with this. This is where we may put some ideas that don't necessarily fit the scope of today's discussion, but we don't want to forget about. And so this is a place, if something comes up, we can always park it here and come back to it later. And with that all being said, I'd like to pass things off to Nicole. Awesome. Thank you, Kate. Um, so excited to be here with you all today and, and excited for the work that we're going to do. Um, we asked you all to bring an artifact or a physical object that reminds you of the first job you ever had. So if you didn't uh, get one yet, uh, scramble quickly and, and look for one. Uh, maybe something around your office uh, reminds you of, um, of your first job. This could be your first job ever or your first job related to early childhood and early learning. Um, and so we're gonna go around and ask everyone to share. When it's your turn, uh, please hold up your object and uh, tell us your name, where you work and who you're representing today. Um, introduce us to your object and what you learned in your first job and how it's informed, uh, informed you throughout your life or sort of shaped your life in some way. Um, and so having this physical object is going to be really important. Um, it's going to serve as your speaking object. So when we're in the large group, because we are a very large group, um, we'll be looking at, um, at everyone's cameras to see who's holding up uh, their objects so that we can um, figure out who to call on or who has something to say. Um, you all know it's really easy to be in a large group of people and for there to be like lots of talking over, lots of side conversations, and we want to try to avoid that as much as possible um, and try to um, ensure that we're listening and learning uh, to each person in, in the meeting. Uh, so in order to participate out loud, we need you to, to be out, uh, be on camera, um, and we'll have Chelsea, um, who will be carefully monitoring everyone's 
uh, camera feed through throughout the uh, meeting so that we know who to call on next. Um, so take take about a minute or less uh, to introduce yourself. These will be brief uh, brief introductions and um, hopeful that that we can get through it uh, pretty quickly with all of us. So I'm going to share my uh, my object is a toothbrush. Hopefully you all can see this. OK, um, my object's a toothbrush. And um, my first job was working at a dental clinic and uh, revising their entire filing system of uh, dental records. Uh, so yeah, for some reason, I did a lot of work in medical records and dental records uh, early on in my career. And um, what that taught me or how I took that into my, my life um, is that I um, was really cognizant of the fact that people need to know how your systems work in order for an organization to work together and collectively. So in order uh, to you know be organized, but also be um, be thoughtful about having systems be self-explanatory and easy for others to understand. Um, and so again, I'm Nicole Travino. I work for the Texas Institute for Child and Family Wellbeing. And so now I'm going to ask Kate to introduce herself um, briefly and share her object. Thanks, Nicole. I forgot to mention something at the beginning here, and so I'm just going to share my screen again. But I did want to mention, uh, we do want you, as you introduce yourselves, uh, tell us who you're representing. So as a member of this council, you're not just representing yourself, you're, remember, you're representing a group of stakeholders. And so for some of you, that means, well, I don't have decision-making power for an entire group of people. That's okay. At some point, your role might be communicating to this group of people. So make sure when you introduce yourselves, you mention who you're representing as well. Um, and so my name is Kate McCurley. I work at the Texas Institute for Child and Family Wellbeing. And today I brought a paintbrush because my first job was at a children's art party business. And so something I learned about that job is the lady who ran the, the art party, she always had an educational um, piece to her art parties, although they were a lot of fun. You know, if it was a Picasso art party, she'd put kids up on a little ladder and they'd get to throw paint on a big canvas. Or if we were doing Monet, she would use the light from the windows to explain how he used light in his paintings. But something I learned from that process was that the best learning sometimes is the learning you don't even know that's happening. It's so fun. And so that is my first job, and you'll see my speaking object, with the, which is a paintbrush throughout the day. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kate. Uh, so now I'm going to go around and kind of call on folks uh, to share their object. So hopefully, hopefully uh, you've had some time to uh, gather an object that, uh, that reminds you of your first job. And so let's start uh, with Reagan. You're the first on, on my screen. Uh, would you like to share next? Okay, so wait, I have to hold it up close. This is an ice cream scoop. My first job, I scooped ice cream in high school. Um, it, it really taught me the value of work and, um, and customer service. I hope it taught me some patience, although I always continue to work on that. So I may have to unblur my background so you guys can see my ice cream scoop throughout the day. Thanks so much, Regan. Um, Kim Coffrin. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I have five little monkeys children's book. Um, uh, not my first job, but my first job in my career. I worked for a child care center that my cousin owned as, as I was toying with the idea of going into this career. Um, somehow it stuck. Um, and, um, uh, Worked for a worked for her. She ran a, a child care center at a hospital um, for a summer. Um, read lots of books that summer um, and learned flexibility because I was a floater. So she would put me wherever I needed to go. So um, that old kids left. So we're moving classrooms, moving kids, and um, all the keep everybody in ratio um, flexibility stuff. So um, flexibility. Awesome. Thank you. 
Uh, June, would you like to go next? Yes. Sorry, I had to find my unmute. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I am June Yateman. I work at Austin Community College Children's Lab School. And my object is a pair of scissors. And it reminds me of my first full-time job in early care and education at a <clears throat> school in Minnesota. And the scissors remind me of the fact that um, when you're working with young children, there's a lot of things that are new to them and that they don't know how to do. Um, and we worked a lot on learning how to do things like cut with scissors. <laughs> um, so that I just keep that in mind always because I'm a classroom teacher. Everything is new to children. Um, so that, that's a good thing for me to remember. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Terry Breeden. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I work in, if you can see this, that turn it this way. It's a syringe because I worked in a medical center when I was in high school. And um, and my thing that I learned from that is also was flexibility, just do whatever that needed to be done at the time. And uh, that, that's all. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sarah Abrams. That's me. Hey. <laughs> um, all right. My item is an octopus hat. And this is because my first job was I was a swim teacher and a lifeguard in the summers. Um, and I feel like this. Oh. I, um, I work for the Department of Family and Protective Services now in the Prevention and Early Intervention Division. And I feel like that first job taught me two things. One was to quickly scan to figure out where there were the most major problems. And the second was that uh, humor and distraction can ease fear more quickly than reason. Awesome, thank you. Love it. I love the hat. <laughs> um, Al Firma Giles. Al Firma Giles, Texas Head Start State Collaboration Office. I represent Head Start and Early Head Start. Um, my first job was really with the diet company called Cambridge Plan International in Monterey, California, but I really didn't find anything interesting to share <laughs> from that job. So I chose this. My career in early childhood began in 1983, and this is a picture of me and my very first student, Alberta. Her name is Alberta Zavalia, and Alberta uh, was a little chirper. She always chirped, chirped, chirped away in my class, and she just connected with me, never let me go. I mean, this kid was five years old and just loved me dearly. I was in an all-Hispanic community in Soledad, California. It's really emotional. Um, from the age of five to the age of 22, we'd stayed in touch, but I had not seen her. She came to see me in Oakland. Um, when I was in Oakland, California, she came to see me from that point until the age of 43. I had not seen her. We lost contact when I left um, California. She hired a private detective to find me. And, um, and last year in August, on August the 15th, she called me. And we laughed and talked and cried on the phone. And she said, I'm coming to see you if it's only for one day. Two weeks later, she came to spend four days with me. And my sweet little Alberta, who is so near and dear to me, heart, taught, to my heart, really taught me the value and the purpose of why we do what we do. Because we never lose a connection. Never. We matter. We impact children and families so much you never know. So she's forever in my heart. And she put on this, she took this picture and sent it to me the day that she came. She says, not what's poured into the student that counts, but what is planted. And she's my, she really instilled a love for early childhood in my life. And I, I've been here ever since. So 
This is my birdie. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So sweet. Uh, Kirsten? Good morning, everybody. Kirsten Schwab, and I um, represent the Texas PBS stations, but for this council, I'm representing nonprofit community organizations that provide wraparound services to, to children and families. And I'm, um, I'm wanting, I hope you guys can see this. I'm wanting to share my first job was um, babysitting, I would say. I mean, the, the literal first time I earned a paycheck. And I think you learn so much when you have that kind of one-on-one -on -one time with a child. You learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot about how families work. You are, you know, kind of a, another person in somebody's home. And so you learn a lot about uh, family organizations um what works and what doesn't work um but it's all that's always been uh that was always a really educational experience for me and i i drew on that experience when i became a parent um and i think i had more understanding and compassion for what a difficult job parenting is so uh, at pbs we try to make it fun so i'm making mine fun um my favorite character obviously you can see i hope you can see um and certainly cookies ought to be part of this meeting. So <laughs> I love it. And I love the little bite out of the corner there. <laughs> Classic cookie monster, right? Uh, Tori Lee. Tori Lee, Texas Education Agency, specifically Early Childhood Division. Um, mine is a shoe, uh, actually my running shoe, which reminds me that I haven't ran in weeks, but that's none of your business. <laughs> Um, my first job was at Foot Locker. I was hired on a Monday and quit on a Tuesday. Um, what did it teach me? Decisiveness. I know what I like. And I was not um, a fan of folding those t-shirts. I was there to talk to the people, not to actually work for the people. Um, and so, yes, yeah, probably why I talk for a living a lot today. That's great. Knowing, knowing what you want is, is important. Uh, Tori, who are you representing? Um, education, early childhood division. Thank you. And Becky Huskeeler. Okay, here's my list. This is not from my, my first job, you know, was babysitting too, but um, my very first job out of college, I went uh, to, I, first of all, I, uh, represent higher education. Uh, the four-year faculty members of higher ed, Catherine Abba does the two-year and I do the four-year. <laughs> and I teach at University of Houston, clear like a pro pro professor of early childhood education. But I have this little um, this little music box. And I, I'm from Pennsylvania, Williamsport, home of Little League Baseball. But this, uh, when I first started, I got a part-time job, was well, they had half day kindergarten at the time and I got a job in the public schools, but they went for as a kindergarten teacher. I was thrilled. I had come out of a bachelor and master's degree. I was an honor student. I was way to go. Turned out that they went on strike uh, up in North. They're all unionized. See, and I was there like two days and they went on strike. I didn't come back till October. Very dysfunctional situation. The apple, it's hard to see, but it has cracks in it. <laughs> so I was so disillusioned because, you know, I was expecting to have a great career and, and it just went. And so what it taught me, and I did end up getting subsequent jobs outside the public school for a while. And, you know, and I ended up being very successful as a kindergarten and early primary grades teacher. But what it did teach me is it's more than just no, the, the atmosphere is important where you work and the type of environment that is is where you are um, and the families, you're there for the children and the families, but the infrastructure can really pull you down. And I think that's what's happening a lot of times at many areas of our education today, that the, infra the teachers are great but the infrastructure does not support them. So oftentimes, so that's why the cracked apple. But I end up, I've been at UH Clear like 32 years. You know, I'm still at it, but you have to keep going. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. 
<laughs> Thank you. All right, let's see. Uh, April Crawford. Hello, I'm April Crawford. I'm at the University of Texas Health Science Center, the Children's Learning Institute, and uh, I'm a representative for the research community. And I brought a calculator. My first job as a young teen throughout my teen years was assisting uh, in our family business. And I helped a lot with sort of cleaning up invoices and cleaning up, you know, old handwritten kind of ledgers. And I learned early that uh, the details really matter. All of these things really can balance. You're going to have to solve some problems to get there. Uh, and I learned a lot about, um, you know, problem solving and customer service in that job. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Megan Young. Good morning. My name is Megan Young. I'm with the Health and Human Services Commission Early Childhood Intervention Program, or ECI. My object is um, an AP style book. My first professional job, not babysitting, not folding clothes, which I actually really liked working retail and folding clothes. I still love folding clothes since my like Zen time. Um, but my first professional job was working as a copy editor at the Austin American Statesman. My, my background is in journalism before I came into public service. And journalism is actually what led me into public service. I um, worked at the Statesman, and I really was drawn to all the articles about state uh, program administration, especially in health and human services. And um, when I found out I was getting laid off, I decided to go to school and then transition into public service. So what I learned from that is I think so many very things, but if I had to just pick one to focus on today, I would uh, focus on the importance of communication and um, just kind of how important transparency and communication is with the public who we're ultimately here to serve. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Rochelle? Okay, I'm not sure how well this is gonna show up, but this is a day, Nope, it's not showing up at all. It's a daily plan. Hold on. What if I do this? There a go. daily planner. <laughs> so I'm Rochelle Daniel. I represent um, child care regulation with Health and Human Services. And um, this actually represents my first professional job. I, I did have some of those you know, fast food type things before that. Um, but straight out of college, I became a caseworker for Child Protective Services. Um, and this planner reminds me of a how many um, how many lives I've touched. Um, I actually have every planner um, from when I first started, and I have names of visits and parents and you know not confidential pieces, first names, um, but um, ways that remind me of of all the lives that I that I touched. Um, and in hindsight, it kind of keeps me humble in that what seemed like this was just my daily job at the time of, you know, picking a kid up or taking them here or making a, a staffing, you know, a decision. Um, ultimately that impacted lives in ways that I may not even know at this point. Um, so it just kind of keeps me, you know, kind of reminding me that um, little decisions that I make and choices I make have huge, can have huge impact, positive or negative. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see, Maricela Nava. We still can't hear you. I'm so sorry, Maricela. Very cool. I love it. I think we've I think we've got the a good sense of what you shared. Lovely. Awesome. And uh, let's see, Angeli. Oh, we can't hear you either, Angeli.
Yeah, we still can't hear you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, for those that are having audio trouble, you might try calling in by phone. I don't know if that's an option. All right, uh, Cindy, Cindy Daniels Dixon. Ah, uh, yeah, you may need to join with I, a computer audio. Nicole, I think we've gone through all of our council members. Oh, all the council members. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, observers, but no, no need to, to hop on. But yeah. um, I just wanted to bring us back to um, our jam board. And by a show of uh, speaking objects, who is familiar with jam board? Yeah. Okay. So some of us are familiar. Don't worry. I'm about to do a little tutorial. Um, so Jamboard is made by Google. It's super simple. I really highly suggest you all um, open it up in another browser window so you can flip through at your own leisure. But one of the first things to know about Jamboard is that we've got 12 slides on here which you can flip back and forth through yourself but i'm looking on the first slide today and i mentioned this earlier some of you we didn't catch who you're representing today so you may see a little sticky note is it, as they're called on the um on the jam board space you're able to edit that sticky note so with the sticky note that has your name in it tell us who you're representing and so you click on that sticky note, a little window like this should pop up and you should be able to fill it in. And then you hit save and that will save it. So we'll give you a minute to just tell us the group of people you're here representing. And that could be different from where you work. <laughs> So, yeah, an example of representing versus where you work is I work obviously for UT at the Texas Institute for Child and Family Wellbeing, um, but I am also the aunt to a preschooler myself and do lots of preschool pickups. And uh, so I think I, I might, if I were on the council and, and uh, in that capacity uh, in, in this meeting, I might be representing families of um, of children in early childhood programs. And so we'll be using this Jamboard a lot today. And so I'll show you a few times how to use it, but I'm gonna hop back over to my slides and introduce you. Speaking of families, we're gonna anchor a lot of our discussion today in one family in particular. And so I wanna introduce you all to the Martinez family. And so straight off the bat, I want you to know this is a fake family, but we're using them as a guide to help us guide our discussion. And so you will get to know the Martinez family really well in our sessions. So we're gonna use them continuously. And I'm gonna fill you in with more details as we go, particularly after we have a needs assessment data presentation, I'll fill you in with more information about them. But for today, what you know about the Martinez family is that they live in Texas and they have more than one child who is under the age of five. And so I want you to keep them in mind as we talk about things today. So our first discussion question. In 2023, what do families need so their children can be physically, emotionally, socially and mentally ready for their first day of kindergarten in Texas. We were really deliberate about this question. We wanted to have a good opening question for you all. As I mentioned earlier, we did 19 interviews with individual council members and we did a survey. And so we based our findings off of that for this question. 
And so one of the main things you should, you probably have already noted is we're expanding the scope a little bit past school readiness. We heard a lot about that in our interviews. And so that's why you see the physical, emotional, and social and mental here. We also wanted to make sure the conversation was current. So we've got 2023 on there, right? A lot has happened since 2019. So let's think about what has happened in the last few years and bring that to the discussion. The other thing I want you to think, just know is that we are gonna talk about needs today, but that does not replace the rich data we're gonna get from the needs assessment team. We're just using this as a starting point, a launching point. So I'm gonna head back over to Jamboard and I'm heading over to Jamboard 2. And so I have our question up there. And so what you all are gonna do I'm going to set a timer for three minutes, and you're going to get as many ideas up there as possible. By the way, Jamboard is anonymous, so feel free to throw up as many as you possibly can in the next three minutes. And just as a, as a little demo here, the sticky note function is the fourth one down on the left hand um, menu here. And so you click on that, this little note comes up, you put in your response and you hit save. And you can add as many as you want and hit save as many times. And then when you hit cancel, that's when you get out of the window. All right. So by a hold of speaking sticks, is everybody ready to do that? Okay, I'm gonna set a timer. Let's go.
Okay. Time's up, everyone. I I think you might have all heard a little uh timer buzzer, right? Yes? Okay, good. You'll be hearing that a lot today. <laughs> Hopefully it's not too annoying. Well, look at this board. This is amazing. Lots and lots of needs, right? Let's take a minute. I'll be resizing some of these, not because they're not any more or less significant, but we just want to be able to see everybody's stickies. And so just take a minute and read your fellow council members' contributions. Try to pick up on some patterns. What are you, what are you noticing? What are some similarities or differences between the things you put on the board and some other people did? Just take a minute and check it out. So by holding up your speaking stick, does anyone want to share a pattern or something they've noticed about what's on the board? I'm looking. Oh, Reagan, I see that ice cream scoop. None of these talk about the programs that we operate. That's a good observation. Alferma. What stood out to me was a lot of um, connections about the workforce, qualified workforce. Um, even it may be said differently, but that's what it means. Someone who can nurture relationships, um, good caregivers, qualified, dedicated staff. There's a there's a thread there. There's a common thread. Okay, yeah. That's a good one. What else do we see on here? Megan. Um, I think there's a lot there's one that's kind of jumping out right in the middle here. This is basic needs met and that there's a lot of different um specific examples and, and some more general examples throughout there that you know, aren't um, necessarily thought of when you think of, when someone might talk about kindergarten readiness, they might be like, oh, do they recognize their letters and numbers? But we have things like housing, food, clothing, um, just feeling safe. You know, a lot of these kind of base base level needs um, that aren't necessarily traditionally academic in nature. Thank you, Megan. Reagan, I saw that ice cream scoop again. Yeah, sort of building on Megan's point, I mean, so often when people think about being ready for school, they do think about, do you know your ABCs? Do you know your one, two, threes? You know, do you have that kind of basic education? And I think so much of our focus is on the well-being of the child and of the family um, so that they're sort of propped up in being ready for school beyond um, literacy and numeracy. Okay. By a show of speaking sticks, does everyone agree that they're seeing basic needs as a as a pattern here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And back to Al Firmer's point, yeah, there is a definitely um it is said in different ways, but the relationships that are involved. And so that could be workforce relationships or the parents' relationships. I see that as a theme here. What else are we seeing? Kim? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get used to the sick. Um, I mean, there's still the there's still the child care piece. There's the high quality early learning programs, access to preschool. So that that thread still is in there. Multiple um uh multiple, you know. Child care, family, child care, head start, public school, like making sure that they're all all there, um, which again, 
we all know that all leads back to the workforce, right? So we have to have a high quality workforce to have high quality environments. The systems are important to you, but the workforce is there. Yeah, for sure. What else are we seeing? Alfirma. I see a high need for health, um, um, mental health, health care, um, food, I mean, food and shelter. That I think that um, encumbers that too. Mental health is jumping out at me. Basic needs, which and could encumber health and um, wellness, stable housing, all of that, that, that comes into immunizations, so I think health and access to health care, mental health support is um, one of the key things that I see here too. Safe place to live and uh, all the basic needs that uh, a family would, um, to ensure that families are, are well cared for and that they have what they need for their children. Thank you, Alferma. Kirsten. Um, I also see a lot um, of needs specifically for parents. So training and, and access and knowledge about resources. And um, I think to Reagan's point that there's a lot more we can do to kind of connect these things in our system and to make sure parents have access to those things. Okay, yeah, for sure. Who else? Reagan. I just wanted to second what Kirsten said. There's so much on here about the parents and the families. Yeah, for sure. So right now I'm seeing basic needs, really, right? And that might encompass a lot, right? Um, I'm curious about the basic needs one. As this group, would you also include the health aspect of that in basic needs? Is that in the basic needs category by a raise of speaking stick? Okay, just wanted to clarify that. And then we see a lot of um, things related to the parents. So that's definitely a category. And then we talked a little bit about the workforce and the relationships around that family, right? So that's definitely a category. Is there anything else that maybe hasn't fit into one of those categories just yet? June. I saw a sticky that said social emotional readiness and that like really pinged for me. It's like, um, for me, those early years, it's all about learning how to self-regulate, learning how to manage your feelings and your actions and to learn about relationships. And I don't know if that like goes with relationships, but when I saw that sticky, I was like, yes, in order for children to be ready for kindergarten, they have to have some social emotional experiences where they can interact with other people beyond their family and know what to do. Got it. So not quite for parents, but for the child it's themselves. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm sort of driving us towards our next step. I wanted to come up with broad level categories out of this wonderful group of ideas. And so by a show, we're going to vote on this. So I want to make sure we're heading in the right direction. I'm thinking one category is definitely basic needs. So go ahead, if you agree, hold up that speaking stick or speaking object. <laughs> okay, for sure. What about um, relationships around that family like a work workforce members? Okay, so that will be our another category. And then just as June mentioned, that socio-emotional piece around the child themselves. Who thinks that's a category we should explore more? Think about it. 
can you go back to the second category? I'm not sure how we got there or what. Can you tell me a little bit more about it? Mm, okay, yeah. So the one that sticks out the most for me is this positive caregiver relationships. And of course, that could mean the caregivers between themselves, but I also see relationship skills. And I see there was someone over here. I think it got moved. But anyone else can call out where they're seeing the relationships. Are, are you meaning the relationships between the family and the professionals that would be supporting the family? Is that the specific category that we're honing in on? I'm just trying to make sure I understand. Mm, okay. What well, that's, a, that's a good question. That's what I was saying, but maybe that's not what came out of this. What do you all think? Is that was the, my question as well. I was yeah i was trying to understand if we if we were broadening it to be the relationship it, is that the relationship it, that, that they have with with any of the workforce that they interact with yeah or and, is, and that's separate and apart from the parent aspect that we've also discussed right kim what do you think I guess I kind of see it in two different buckets. We've got to care for the workforce. If that's the child care workforce or the ECI workforce or you know, all the different programs we all the state agencies do, if we don't have good quality workforce at all the different levels, then those relationships are in jeopardy because of the turnover, because of the the caregivers aren't paid well if the, you know, everything down to the licensing staff, right? Licensing reps, when those relationships, when that turnover happens and that affects the child care program, that then affects their quality, that then can affect their Texas Rising Star numbers. I mean, it's just such a trickle effect. So it's it's caring for the caregivers, or not the caregivers, the workforce at all different levels that then affects the relationships. So I think it's, it's one, it's the training and making sure those caregivers have the, the, the skills to have those relationships but we got to care for the workforce to make sure people want to come into this field, that they want to have a career here and, and have a, be able to afford their own families and their own dreams. So like, I think that's the two different, to me, that's how I bucket the two. It's one, it's caring for that, that whole workforce, as well as then what those, that workforce does with those parents and children, um, no matter how they touch them. And Kim, as for you, as part of that workforce support, does it also link up with families in the form of access to high quality services? Oh, hundred like, percent, right? Yeah, almost like you could have child, you know, positive relationships for children, and then you could have access to quality services and right. workforce development and support. Yeah. And they, they've got to have the training to have those workforce, to have that relationship, right? We've all had the teacher. We've all had the licensing rep. We've all had the ECI staff person that can't, doesn't have the training to ha make that interpersonal re relationship and that that relationship successful. So they need that training, but we also have to make sure that this is, um, that they are supported in all aspects. And because that affects the quality, no matter what programs we're trying to serve, if they're not taken care of as caregivers, if they're not taken care of as educators, as ECI staff, you name the name the early childhood profession in there, um, they're not going to be able to give that to children and families. Okay. So we've got basic needs. We also have that access to high quality services, which includes workforce supports and training. What do people think about exploring um, a parent category and everything that is related? You know, the, the uh, skills building, the relationship skills, the positive relationships. By a show of a uh, speaking object, what do you all think about that one? Okay. So parent skills, 
Hey, can I ask a clarifying question? Yeah. These buckets that we're making, what's the next step with the, like, are we firm in these buckets? This is what's going to be in the strategic plan, or is this just our starting point? Like, help me define, like, what are we starting point in the importance of this vote? <laughs> starting point. Okay. <Kim. laughs> We're taking it one step at a time here. Don't worry. There's no, there's no Sharpie markers here today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we have a basic needs. We have an access to high quality services. And then let's think about our fourth category here. Was there one we already said? I have a question. Yes, June. Um, I was just wondering about the whole issue of access period just like access to information access to services um access to knowledge um because it's been my experience that um a big part of serving families and their children is figuring out what information do they need access to and how can that get shared um, and I know there have been some stickies that have sort of mentioned that too. So I'm just wondering about that. I'm curious, June, if that is just something we should think about for all the categories as sort of like a blanket, sort of like, okay, access, expanding that access versus having it be a category itself. Okay. And then I wanted to come back to that category you mentioned earlier about the child. Um, is that a category we might want to explore a little further? You know, what the child specifically needs? I mean, we're talking a lot about their families and the services around them, but do we want a category specific to children? Hold up a, I don't know. It's up to you all. Yeah, I think so. Okay, okay. So just to assure you all, no Sharpie markers today. <laughs> we're, we're using these categories as a jumping off point in our discussion, not as a way to limit the discussion or put something down in ink. But the reason why I wanted to pick three category, uh, four categories today is because I want to take all of these great kernels these are just kernels, right? We just spent three minutes putting as much on the board as possible. I, I wanna churn these kernels into rich ideas. And so this is where we start to get more illustrative and descriptive about what we're talking about. And so I gave you an example here on this jam board. Families need accessible, high quality ch childcare. That's very similar to something that's on the last board, right? But a, a rich idea doesn't take shortcuts. It doesn't use jargon like accessible or high quality. It explains what those things might mean, right? And so it could get a little wordy at first. That's okay in this process. It's important to fully define what we mean when we talk about these things. And so what I'm going to do is I'm sending you all into little breakout rooms to work with each other. And you're going to take your category and come up with three rich ideas. I know three, only three. I know. But I th I'm thinking as you guys get more descriptive, you probably can take a lot of ideas from that first jam board and combine them, right? If there's a list of services or needs, you can add them right into one. And the idea around this activity is to really just hone in on how to distinctly and concisely describe this, right? And so we need three statements from you. And so here's my example. By the way, I'm not saying this is everything that is accessible or high quality about childcare, but I just wanted to give you an example. Instead of saying families need accessible, high quality childcare, we might say families have childcare that they can afford, is close to their work or home, is open the hours that they work, and participates in Texas Rising Star. 
you guys can add a bunch of stuff to that, but I just wanted to show you the direction we're heading. And so make sure you illustrate the who, what, and how. You're allowed to be wordy. It's okay. We'll be doing plenty of wordsmithing in this progress. Um, the other thing to note is let's change this from what families need to something that might have already occurred. Let's think about in the future. Let's think about it as a statement. So we started off with families need this, and now we're talking about what families already have. Let's go ahead. It's strategic planning, people. It's time to think about what we want for the future, okay? Is everybody ready for that? Can okay. I ask one clarifying question? Yes, you may. <laughs> I think so, you know, the question that we were initially responding to is what do families need so their children? So I yes. think it I'm trying to figure out are these statements that we're writing next still kind of grounded in this perspective of what does a family need to take care of their children or to support their children's readiness versus writing statements that are a little more about you know, broad, what do children specifically need? There's, it's just a little difference in framing between writing for the family, the system of supports or resources for the family versus what does a child need? Mm. Now I have a question. We have a category for children. Um, so right. child at the end. So kind of stepping away from that first question and now yeah. writing statements. Yeah. Even at the Level. Yes. Got it. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So we've assigned you into four categories. And so if you flip through the jam board, you'll see what what a uh, group you're in. And so if you're in group one, you're actually going to stay with me in the main room. And then if you're in group two, you're gonna head out to group two's breakout room with Nicole. And then if you're in group three, you're gonna head out to a breakout room with Chelsea. And then if you're in group four, you'll be with Alex. And so we're just gonna go in order of our list here. Group one, we're gonna address basic needs. Group two, we're gonna talk about, you guys are gonna talk about high quality services. I'm going to take access out because I think we've decided access is just a part of every single one of these groups. Group three, you're going to talk about parent skills. And group four, you're going to talk to think about things specifically pertaining to the child. Does that sound good? Is everybody ready? Are you going to put us in the group? The, yes, you're going. It'll pop up and say our yes. number, and then we go in. Okay. Yes. Don't worry about it. You're just going to end up in a in the room you need to be in. I promise. <laughs> all right. Ready? All right. We'll see you all back here in 20 minutes. All right. How's everybody doing? <laughs> That was a well-deserved break. <laughs> I'll, wait. I'll wait to see a little bit more cameras back on so I know people are here. All right. Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> How was that last activity? Short. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay. So we have gotten everybody's rich ideas. I don't mean written in stone ideas up on a jam board um, so you can all read each other's ideas but i think it would be great if one 
member of each group talks about the ideas that they have and the process behind it and maybe some of the remaining lingering thoughts they might have about their three rich ideas. So I'll start with group one. Who from our group would like to mention something about the yellow stickies? And this was the basic needs group, by the way. And I'll add that to our Gene I'm happy board. to talk, but I'd also love to give give other members an opportunity to represent the group. That's why I didn't say anything, Megan. I was waiting for someone else, but I did. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Tell us about it. Alfirma or Reagan. It's okay. Go ahead, Reagan. Oh, okay. Um, so we started off with a, a pretty long list of basic needs. And I think our biggest challenge was trying to put them into buckets that made sense as we could only have three buckets. Uh, so the, the second bucket that you see there, housing, nutritious food, reliable transportation, clothing, health care for parents and children. Um, we sort of put those as, as one of our buckets. Our first one you see there, we, we didn't get a lot of time to flesh this out, but this was this was kind of a lot of times of how do you have access to to good to employment that that lets you earn funding enough money to help support your family and might you need access to additional support with training or education to upskill uh, so that you're better able to meet your family's financial needs. And then the third bucket on the far right um, had to do with how do you have easy, easy access to and availability to obtain all of the early learning services that your child may need. Um, so across the spectrum, all of the, the services that are available, they need to be both easy to, to know how to reach and also available um, to parents. All right, thank you, Reagan. How about a representative from the Green Sticky Group that was with Nicole discussing high quality services? Hey, I'll do it. And um, first of all, we said uh, every family is able to get connected to the services they need and the services are inclusive for all children. There are a lot of services out there, but oftentimes parents either they're filled already, they don't qualify, you know, it's hard for them to link up and to know not only that they're there, but that uh, how to really to access it. And also we talked about children with disabilities because there are a lot of other a lot of services that parents don't know about, especially if their child has a disability. And the second one, education and social services are available to meet their child's needs and are available to all families where they live and all uh, children who qualify will receive services. Again, we talked about oftentimes there are specific numbers of slots at these different like subsidized child care or Head Start slots, early Head Start slots. And in some areas, they fill up fast. And so those services might be there, but they might not be able to access them for one reason or another. So that's what one of the things that we talked about that um, uh, not only just knowing about them, but having enough available for the people who qualify. And then the services, the other one, number six, their services providers have high enough pay to stay in their field to support and support to receive training in early childhood education and development and availability of training throughout their career. And I guess coming from higher ed, that's so important, as I mentioned before, to not just have anybody off the street working with these little children, but to have people a well-educated workforce and that the pay is su substantial enough for the, these people to be able to work on their own and just not having to be a second income you know, that this, they have enough to be able to support themselves and that they not just have training and education 
initially, but it's ongoing because thing, they have different types of little children that come in. They need information on children, working with children with disabilities, English language learners, all different types. It needs to be continuous throughout their whole career, not just a one-shot deal or the 24 quick hours that they have, uh, a little workshop type, one-shot workshops. So that's, and it needs to be low pay, low cost or no cost to the uh, providers. So that's what we came up with. Thanks, Becky. How about the blue group that was with Chelsea? I can start um, for our group. There's still plenty of refining to do with these, but the first one is um, basically about sort of families having access to information and knowing how to sort of navigate navigate where they want to go next with that information. So having awareness of supports and, and resources that are available to them uh, so they can make informed decisions for their family. The second one is really more about specific uh, parenting behaviors or caregiver behaviors that we know uh, support healthy child development. So um, families having access to, if they need it, training, educational opportunities to learn to support children's physical, cognitive, and social emotional development. And the third one is more about families, you know, because the social emotional development and relationship uh, skills that we all kind of talked about as important precursors to kindergarten entry, because that doesn't happen just by interacting with your family, that um, parents and caregivers would be in a community context where they could expose their children to um, multiple opportunities for children to develop social and emotional skills. Thanks, April. What about the orange group? June and I arm wrestled virtually and I won. So, or lost, oh. depending on how you look at it. Um, so, um, so we were focused on the child um, and we first came up with a kind of three buckets. Um, so the first one, 10, is really around social emotional. Um, 11 is really around developmental screeners and assessments and access and to those. And this and 12 is really about an environment and we kind of focused on the outdoor um, space. So um, digging into 10, just again, that ability for a child to manage and understand their feelings, their resiliency, adaptability, practicing those skills. We have all three of us, it was myself and Raquel and June have heard providers over the last couple of years really talk about the challenging behaviors they're seeing in children right now um, due to the pandemic, due to the, due to lack of that social network and access to other adults besides parents and parents doing what they can and with what they have and all that piece. So really making sure that relationship with supportive adults and we used adults purposely and not just parents, so that it's all the adults in their lives, um, if it's in childcare or nannies or um, um extended family members, et cetera. So um, 11 was really talking about that screen, access to screeners and catching developmental delays at the appropriate time and then timely interventions. We know there's a backlog. We know that the, the, those we might get, a, it might get diagnosed or a screener, but then to get them fully assessed or get the interventions happening, that's all um, part of um, lack of funding and um, um, you know, families access to, especially in our rural communities, making sure that they have um, have access to those those things that those of us that live in the metroplex areas take for granted. Um, and then twelve is really that access and experience to outdoor and natural world, hands on experiences and activities that lead to autonomy and that self help um, and that routine um, mundane everyday activities. So really making sure environments are inclusive and. Um, giving them the, the children those experiences that many of us had as a child. So when we grew up in the, or for me, grew up in the seventies and eighties. So. Thanks, Kim. All right. This is a great starting point. <laughs> uh, you guys did a great job. Um, so we're going to have a little bit of fun with this. I'm going to put you back in your breakout rooms. No, I'm not giving you another opportunity to refine or come up with more ideas 
what we're going to do is dig deep far into the, maybe not too far into the future hopefully soon right and i want you to pick one of your rich ideas and imagine it has been accomplished right what would be the texas tribune's headline when one of your rich ideas was accomplished what would it say right what would be the big headline and then I want you to think about the little byline text that comes after a big headline. It kind of actually describes what they're describing. So this might be a strategy that occurred to help that big idea actually happen. So I'm gonna set the breakout rooms again for five minutes. You get five minutes to think of a headline and then that headline's byline that kind of is more descriptive. Okay, sound good? Show of speaking speaking objects that we're ready all right we'll see you back here in five minutes okay the room's filling back up welcome back everybody all right So that was a little fun. <laughs> uh, so I already put group one's um, headline. Maricela, do you want to tell us what it is? Yes, uh, pretty much. Uh, there was a group consensus that all children are eligible for pre-K in Texas. Guess what? Texas Ledge passes bill for universal pre-K. Yay! Nice. <laughs> Very nice. How did uh how's what what's group two? Someone from our group want to share? I'll share this time. Um so we, we went the human interest story back to the, the Martinez family, Kate, that you mentioned at the beginning um, as a family that benefited from the high quality services. So our focus was high quality services. And so our headline was Martinez family celebrates son graduation. Um, and uh, the subheading is that family credits expansion of disability inclusive Head Start services and well qualified teachers for son success in school. Woo, yay. <laughs> <laughs> what about blue group? One of you like to share this time? Sure, I'll take that one. So our headline: Record breaking parenting support and education. And then our byline of all parents and caregivers in Texas have access to parent education at birth. Nice. Woo. <laughs> All right. What about our orange group? Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry, my mute button disappeared or unmute button disappeared. Um, so our byline or our headline was every child screened by kindergarten for developmental, oh, developmental and learning needs met, families are connected with interventions. And then our byline was due to increase in funding for ECI and state budget, more ECI staff hired and more children served. Wonderful. These are great. Let's get to work. <laughs> All right. Well, that was fun. I definitely, I, I want to reiterate no Sharpie markers today. Okay. Um, as we, we are going to come back to these rich ideas. Um, and in fact, I'm going to head the, uh, my speaking object over to Nicole. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. Um, so yeah, for our next activity, we're going to assess how often the Texas early learning system is able to accomplish, uh, these rich ideas that we've come up with. Um, we're gonna ask you to think through each one. Uh, do they, are they accomplished uh, never, sometimes, 
often or always. Um, and so we sent you a link to a Google form before the meeting. Uh, in this form, we've added all of these. This is why there's four of us from our team, because uh, folks are working in the background um, as even as we're doing other things. Uh, so we've added each, each idea into the Google form, um, and we'd love for you all to um, uh, ask you to uh, take those, those ideas and put them into uh, one of these four categories or sort of rate them um, on one of those four categories, never, sometimes, often, or always. Um, so we'll give you 10 minutes to complete the form. Um, and then when that 10 minutes is up, uh, we'll talk through each one and, and see how it got rated uh, by our team. And Nicole, just for clarifying, this is currently? Yes, this is the current state current state so mm -hmm. not our dreams this is what's not our dreams right yeah now. we're we're coming back to the ground uh okay. in, in our current state yeah great right. question other questions all right well Kate's gonna start our timer um and then uh, again, you'll have 10 minutes to think through these. And after the timer ends, um, we'll talk through them one by one.
30 second warning. All right, looks like time is up. Thanks, Kate. Um, so let's let's look at each one. Uh, the first one, parents can easily reach and obtain services related to employment slash income, training slash education, and finances. Um, so we had 83.3% um, uh, mentioned that that happens sometimes. That's about 10 of you felt that way. And 16.7 uh, or two of you felt uh, that, that that question or that uh, topic uh, happens uh, so, uh, happens often, sorry. Um, then we'll go down to number two. Uh, parents can easily reach and obtain stable housing and nutritious foods, reliable transportation, clothing, comprehensive health care for parent and child. So everyone that responded, uh, responded sometimes. Number three, uh, families can easily reach and obtain early learning services they need. Uh, so 11 folks said sometimes, and one person said often. Every family is able to get connected to the services they need, and the services are inclusive for all children, including those with, disability, uh, with disabilities. So um, nine people said sometimes, and three people said never. Number five, educational and social services that meet, meet their ch child's needs are available to all families where they live and all children who qualify receive services. Uh, so seven folks said sometimes, uh, one person said often, and four people said never. For number six, uh, service providers have high enough pay to stay in the field support to receive training in early childhood development and availability of training throughout the, throughout their career including you know training that's affordable so eight said sometimes and four said never number seven caregivers have knowledge of existing supports resources and opportunities to make informed decisions for their families um, meet families where they are. So uh, 11 people said sometimes and one person said often. Number eight, parents and caregivers have the skills to nurture and support children in developing physical, cognitive, and social emotional development uh, from prenatal. 10 people said sometimes and two people said often. Number nine, parents and caregivers are thriving in a community that enriches the social emotional development and relationship skills of the child. 10 people said sometimes, um, one person said often, and one person said never. Every child, uh, number 10, every child can manage and understand their feelings, uh, resiliency and adaptability, experience practicing these skills, uh, relationships with supportive adults. Nine people said sometimes, uh, two people said often, and one person said never. Number 11, um, access to screeners, timely interventions available at all levels, including pediatrician offices, childcare, public schools, etc. Uh, eight people said sometimes, and four people said often. Number 12, access to and experiences with the outdoors and natural world, hands-on activities, learning autonomy, and self-help in the routine, mundane, everyday. 
Eight people said sometimes and four people said often. So thanks for, um, for your great uh, contributions to that. Um, and thanks Kate for pulling this up. Uh, so we've sort of sorted, um, sorted uh, all of these into the buckets that they, they fell into um, from never, sometimes, often, or always. And it looks like all of them uh, really hit the sometimes uh, category pretty, uh, pretty strongly. Uh, so yeah, I'm curious how um, what reflections you have on where things ended up and and how folks rated something. Can I say something? June. Yeah, go to um, this is June. Um, if in the statement it referred to all children or all families or like all the time or every child, every family, then I said never <laughs> because to me, that was the, the most important part of the statement that all families got this service or every child it got to experience this. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, if those qualifiers weren't in there, then I put sometimes. Mm -hmm. that, that's just how it rolled for me. Yeah, thanks for that. Other reflections? Kate? Oh, you you reminding me to remind them to use their, their talking items. <laughs> uh, Kim, I think for the most part we were all in agreement. I think there was a few nevers, a few oftens, but for the most part, sometimes. Mm -hmm. It really depends on where you live and your income and all the other factors that um, your education level, um, what type of job you have, like all those other factors that we all know affects families' access um, and choices. Um, and for some of our families, that's not a problem. And for other families, it's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. Any other reflections? Okay. Well, thank you again for, um, for going through that with us. Um, so we're going to narrow down our ideas uh, a little more uh, to a manageable few set of ideas. Um, so, um, I think that we've got uh, we've got pretty much everything in that sometimes category, um, and um, yeah, I'm uh, I'm thinking about how we how we narrow down to a manageable few. Um, so I don't know, Kate, thoughts on on that? First off, I just want everybody to kind of. If you see everything on here, mm -hmm. right, is this everything, right? <laughs> is this everything that the Texas Early Learning System is trying to do? Yes, Reagan. So I'd say no. I think one of the things that's not captured on here is sort of the administrative side of things. In our last plan, there was a lot of input about, um, I, I call it administrative, but like on the data side, how do you do, you know, a lot of it is stuff that supports families. So creating um, automated systems that are easier for parents to use or early childhood data systems that allow you to do more analysis. I think we've really focused on the families and children, but this other aspect on the administrative side, we haven't really delved into yet. Got it. Megan. Yeah, and just to build on that, um, you know, Reagan talked about the data, and part of that was like helping make it easier for families to access services, but the other part is helping us as administrators know whether we've achieved any of these outcomes, right? Like, can we measure the success of our initiatives? Can we 
drill down and identify gaps? Can we see, hey, in my data system, I have this kid in ECI and I have this kid in Head Start and I know that they're the same kid because right now the data doesn't talk to each other in that way. Perhaps I would add that to a measurable uh, data system with measurable outcomes or measurable indicators. Okay. Is there anything else that we want to make sure stays within our, our exploration of the strategic plan? And don't worry, we'll, we'll wordsmith this data one at some point. Kate, I raised my hand. I mean, well, I raised my, <laughs> my eye. Yes, yes, I, uh, Parama. And I just want, in, in um, connection with what Megan just said, I think it should also include something about guiding our decision-making because that's what we want the data to do. We want it to guide our decision-making as it relates to uh, improving child and family outcomes. Um, because if it doesn't, got our decision making the data just becomes data we have to use it to make informed decisions got it thanks good point Kim um along those same lines and kind of connecting more of the dots one of those very first slides you showed about all the different state agencies that affect early childhood Governance is also part of that systems making and how do our state agencies talk to each other, serve families together? What is that? We know what our current system looks like, but what? how could we rethink our systems to better serve children and families? Mm -hmm. Also, um, you did see my book, right? Um, yes, also, go I guess uh, going in that same note right there, it would it also entail like the linkage across the programs, kind of um, like with the regulation piece as well. Makes sense. Okay. One thing I noticed on that interagency, there was nothing about higher ed in that in that whole mm -hmm. matrix. And so, but we're talking about higher, you know, a well-educated workforce, et cetera, like that. So if without any, without that partnership with higher education, whether it be the two or four-year universities and mm -hmm. colleges, you know, that's leaving a whole part out. And so, and it's not at all in that matrix for the age, you know, that big one that you had with all those little <laughs> squares in. So I don't know how we can, add that uh, through higher education um, because that has to be a, mm -hmm. a real part in all of this. Because even the interagency people have to get trained through higher education. You know, not it's sure. not just early childhood ed, but. Mm -hmm. I think that, um... The, the whole idea of the, the communication, not just with government agencies or between government agencies, but higher ed, all the, all the nonprofit agencies that benefit children and families, um, all the providers, that whole atmosphere of communication and collaboration and aligning and align and working together mm -hmm to stay focused on the goal of serving children and families in the state of Texas somehow needs to be focused on because I don't, we're not going to get the desired outcomes unless we're mm -hmm. able to do that. That's what I think. An anti-silo approach. Yeah. You know, so exactly. that everybody exactly. doesn't like when I joined yeah. the Texas Early Learning Council in 2019, I met all these people like a lot of you. I didn't even know about some of these agencies and services because we're in the higher ed silo, you know? And so I think that that's just even educating the different groups about what is offered. That's important too, educating 
you know, within our groups here so that we can collaborate because you can't collaborate if you don't know who to collaborate with. Thanks, Becky. Mm -hmm. I see raised hands. Where are our speaking objects? I'm very. I, I tried to wave my speaking. <laughs> object. Okay, Sarah, 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 go ahead. <laughs> um, I think the one thing that I feel like is worth mentioning, although I'm not entirely sure how, so I'm going to throw it out, and then maybe you guys can help me sort it through. Is is just something to indicate that our invest the invest we the resources and the dollars that we have to pay for all these things are finite in some ways and so identifying both that the resource the investments we're making are a reflection of these things that it is that we want to have happen um and that we are collectively being the best stewards of the dollars we have access to given the given whatever guardrails are there um i just think that is essentially what we're doing now is we're making investments and we're trying to do the best we can with the resources we've been given. Um, and, th and this is really in part about figuring out how are we measuring? Are we doing that? And then how do we keep coming back to, to confirm that, that we're doing the best we can with what we've got um, and then addressing together what else we need? Thanks, Sarah. Him. I see that five little monkeys. <laughs> uh, to build on what Sarah said, not only are we being good stewards of our current dollars, but also how limiting our current dollars are. We're only serving X percent of families. We're only able to reach X families. Therefore, if we want to serve all families, we're going to need an investment of X. Like what's what is not only are we being good stewards and making sure the dollars are going as far as they can and reaching the families that they can, et cetera. But also what does that need? We know we're underfunded in all of our different early childhood issues. So how do we advocate state level? How do we advocate the federal level? Um, how do we make sure we are put, telling that whole story um, of where the, where the needs are, knowing where the, knowing where the limited funding is? Thanks, Kim. Okay. And April's got uh, April oh. and <laughs> sorry, April hmm. calculator. <laughs> I was just this is just more of a note <laughs> to this conversation, but it feels like the things we originally identified are more intermediate and sort of ultimate outcomes of a high functioning system, society, <laughs> a little of both is what it looks like. And it feels like the things we're adding now are really sort of drivers or the the activities and things that we think influence those outcomes. So I don't know, it kind of helps me to think about it in terms of like, we outlined outcomes and now we're starting to generate sort of what are the influences or drivers. That is very good observation. Thank you, April. Reagan. Yeah, um, when Kim was talking about the, what, who we can serve, I'm wondering if the needs assessment portion of this project will actually help us get to the needs that are out there. Um, so I'm thinking about this sort of, because we have two different two different products that, that we'll be putting out. Um, so I, I'm thinking in our needs assessment that, you know, I think we'll have a, a bigger opportunity to look at what the needs are out there as well. Yes, for sure. I mentioned when we were walked into this needs discussion, we're definitely gonna combine our thoughts and then really look at what gets presented spe specifically about families, right? What they're accessing and stuff like that. So yes, for sure. All right. So we we didn't eliminate anything from our list, but we added some things. But I still actually think this is a very manageable list to really, we'll reconfigure it. Um, you know, I think the pink stickies that we all talked about, April made up a really great, um, made observation that these might be the drivers towards the other stickies, right? And so we're in a really good place right now. I wanna commend you all in a few short hours we, we've gotten here. And so I wanna hand it back over to Nicole um, so we could just move a little further. 
Yeah, thanks, Kate. Uh, good discussion. And um, so now that we've thought about some of these uh, these elements, I'm curious for folks, um, you know, want to get us uh, started thinking about. Um, oh, is that the is that the next place we're going? Oh, it is. Okay. Um, think about what ideas uh, should and. Sorry, the slides keep shifting. Is it just me? Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> I, got a, I got a little trigger happy. We're on here. We're at who can work alongside families. <laughs> yeah. So um curious thinking about um who can who can work alongside families to accomplish uh the rich ideas that we have. Um so sorry, and that's out of sequence, I think um from where I thought we were um so yeah love to have some some thoughts added to the to the board here on um thanks Kate uh who can work alongside families uh to accomplish our ideas and so I'm gonna put three minutes up and kind of like what we did earlier today just get it all out <laughs> put as many stickies as you want up there and so something to keep in mind before I hit that timer is I want you to keep that Martinez family in mind that I mentioned earlier so you know who does the Martinez family personally interact with who helps them access and utilize all of these great things we want to accomplish right who helps them find what they need so that their children can be physically, mentally, emotionally, and socially ready for that for kindergarten, right? Let's talk about the workforce, okay? Um, who is directly working with a family like the Martinez family? So that's what we're asking in terms of who can work alongside families. So, oh, people are starting. Let mm -hmm. me start that timer. Okay, ready? Yes.
All right. Thanks for your great ideas. Uh, trying to get a few of them resized so we can see um, everything that is on the board. Um, but we've got a lot of great ideas here from um, schools to pediatricians uh, to community based organizations um, like YMCA, um, faith based organizations, uh, neighbors. Uh, Head Start programs, child care services, ECI N619, um, child care referral services, child welfare, uh, librarians, peer navigators, home visiting staff. So we've got a really comprehensive um, list of, of folks here who can work alongside uh, the families like the Martinez family uh, to accomplish some of uh, some of what we've identified. So any specific kind of patterns that are standing out to you as you're as you're looking at what's on the board? Any patterns come to mind, Sarah? Um, I I would we do actually quite a bit of family focus group work, and I'll say to me part of what I think is interesting is just that the way that families, at least in our groups, identify where they get information and resources and who they lean on, and um, this list may be sort of balanced differently. I think our list is very professionally leaning and that that doesn't typically be the sources that families name when they actively talk, when they actively speak about where they get support and where they get resources. It's not that they don't do, that they don't get resources from these other places, but that they're their sort of go-tos are not always in their professional network. And so I just think it's something, or in our professional network, I just think it's something worth highlighting. Yeah, so you bring up a great point, Sarah, some of the potential uh, folks that are missing from this board that should be um, should be on the board. Kim, anything come to mind? Well, to Sarah's point, there's a couple faith-based, church-based organization type places where, and as well as like community and neighborhood mm -hmm. organizations of where families just naturally are, mm -hmm. um, that they don't have to go somewhere else. They just are, it's part of their normal community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. June? I was just going to say that... Um... In my experience, I think a lot of times where families go is is it's it's it is more informal, like Sarah was pointing out, and and it's um it's word of mouth sorts of things. It is they're they're seeking out information, and the first thing they do is go to people that they trust and try and pick their brains, and. Another thing that I haven't seen up here is the whole thing of like social media. It's like, do they Google stuff? I think parents probably do, or they go on Facebook or, you know, they send out a question to people like, what should I do? Who should I go to? Um, and that just sort of occurred to me as Sarah was talking. It's like the whole thing of, social media platforms and um, the digital world <laughs> is it that part of our universe. And I didn't even think about putting that on a sticky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a big uh, communication channel, information channel, right, Kirsten? Yeah, I would, I would include media overall, overall because a lot of people get uh, you know, television is still a place where people get resources, um, you know, along with digital. 
<clears throat> yeah, thank you for that. Megan? Yeah, I think it kind of splitting that kind of social media into two groups, because you have that aspect of social media that that recreates, you know, the, the parents you're talking to in the park, you know, kind of situation and that that one to one kind of social thing. I'm posting in a Facebook group, a mom's group or whatever. And then you have your content creator section where you have these different people who are out there putting out videos about this is how you do this. This is how you whatever. Um, I think those are both coming through social media, but it's important to think about them in separate kind of channels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's sort of that, yeah, even a professional and personal kind of uh, divisions there too. Maybe not not professional either. <laughs> People who are out there, you know, putting out a video, you know, anyone could go put a video up on TikTok, right? Right. Pretend to be an expert. For sure. Becky? Um, I know like uh, there's our, uh, websites like zero to three dot org and watch me grow and oftentimes parents don't know about them and i'm always telling my students about them and also sharing them with parents because those are freely accessible and they have good quality information on them that uh, that they can use and oftentimes they don't know about those so the zero to three dot org and watch me grow those uh types of of websites mm -hmm. Great. Any other reflections on the pattern before we shift to the next, next piece? Anyone we haven't heard from yet that, that has something to share? Just wanted to mention Kim often, uh, Kim asked in the chat what 619 was. <laughs> that was a good ask. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Read your mind. <laughs> Terry? I didn't put that, but I can answer that. That uh, 619 is the program that oversees children ages three to five with disabilities. I've never heard it called 619, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Well, amazing ideas and a lot of a uh, lot of overlap, but also a lot of a um, lot of good ideas in recognizing what didn't come to mind initially. So I'll turn over to Kate now. Thanks, Nicole. This was a really interesting discussion because um, we're going to take a break. Um, and I want you to, during your break, think about stakeholders we might want to engage into this process and learn more from. And so we had a plan to talk about workforce stakeholders, but it sounds like there's other places where families are finding information we might want to explore. So we might think outside the box a little more when we come back about how we want to bring information about those resources back to this group when we meet again. So 15 minutes on the clock and we'll see you all back in a few minutes. All right. Welcome back, y'all. We're in the home stretch. <laughs> I'll wait till I see a few more cameras on just so I know everybody's there. We look forward to hosting you all in person in, in a month here. So I'll know when everybody's back from the break. <laughs> All right, I'll give people one, a couple more, maybe one more minute before I start. And so I just want to commend this group. We've covered a lot of ground today, right? Um, we've got a really distinctive group 
of rich ideas to play around with for the next few months. Um, you also added to that. Um, this last jam board we did lots of different sources of information right and people that walk alongside families to get them to where they need to go and i want to talk a little bit more about stakeholder engagement so our team ut austin we uh as a part of our role as your strategic plan facilitators we will be engaging with any stakeholders you think are necessary to inform this plan properly and so we had in our plan to engage specifically with workforce stakeholders over the next month to combine the needs assessment data with whatever we find out from that engagement but we also can talk about other stakeholders we might want to engage to make sure that we have the necessary information we need to move forward with that being said, how did we plan to engage these stakeholders? So we also, a little bit later on, we also want to engage family stakeholders as well. That's a big piece of this. So for instance, sorry, I went a little too fast. In August, we're going to do our workforce and coalition, coalition strategizing. That's a whole day of talking about the workforce, right? And the coalitions that they might be involved in. And so before that, we may want to look to what stakeholders weren't already engaged in the needs assessment, and I'll present on that in a few minutes, or other workforce stakeholders we might want to talk to to help us strategize. And then we'll be meeting with families throughout August and September and bring that information along with the needs assessment information back to you in October. So with that being said, um, our work our stakeholder engagement is a little bit different than the needs assessment stakeholder engagement yes we might do surveys we might do a focus group like they are but we also are looking to bring back tools that really help you and this group understand how people are experiencing the early learning system and so that could be a wide range of things. I've listed a few on the slide. So we might do video interviews, audio interviews, if our stakeholders are comfortable with that. We might go visit them. We might travel throughout Texas and do some work site visits if that's appropriate. Uh, if we have any writers in our workforce that would like to just like sit down one day and write about what it's like to be in the workforce, that's that's OK, too. And then kind of like what we've been playing with, um, with the Martinez family, we may take all of the needs assessment data and create a profile of a workforce member, some of their needs, pain points, and ask other workforce members to comment on that and provide us with more information so that when we come back in August, we have a, a tool to use and guide our questions. So another important part of this, anyone we engage, gets compensated for their time. Uh, it could be a one-time thing, but it also could be a couple of hours or a couple of sessions, depending on their availability and how much interest they have. And so we need to create a stakeholder engagement action plan, and we're actually asking for your help. Uh, we purposely asked you to identify who you represent at the beginning because I want you to think about that a little bit as we go through uh, these next couple of slides. Who in your network might be able to talk through some things with us in the next month? So it, it just happened on June 30th, but I wanted to take a few minutes just to very briefly do an overview of what we've learned about uh, the workforce so far. Uh, Dr. Dorothy Mendel on June 30th, she did our data presentation. I know many of you were on the call. And so I'm just going to very briefly outline that so we all have that reference point as well as we further go further in this discussion. So uh, the needs assessment team, they define the early learning workforce as these three, uh, five main categories. They consider home visitors, child care directors and staff, ECI directors and therapists, 
public pre-K special education teachers and public pre-K teachers as a part of this early learning workforce. And so something important to note that they haven't been able to tap into the, the pre-K teachers yet. And so they're gonna be, be bringing that data a little bit later to us. And so they conducted a survey, they had 208 survey participants, and this included directors and staff. And so here's a map of where they've conducted their interviews so far. As you can see, there's a lot of activity on the uh, I-35 cor corridor, and then some touch points in West Texas and East Texas. And something important to note about the interviews is that they have conducted interviews in South Texas. It just had not been analyzed and included in their analysis yet. So very preliminary results. She was, uh, Dorothy was really clear about that. She wanted to make sure everyone knew they're still working through the data. But the big one was the workforce is seeing more developmental and behavioral problems in children post-COVID, right? That was a big one. Because of that, right, there's more training needs around behavioral management, right? And then also specifically around hard conversations with parents, how to engage parents into discussing things like a behavioral problem. Uh, more resources around mental health issues. She, she also discussed peer-to-peer -peer training opportunities are highly valued. So, you know, shadowing a more experienced teacher or staff member or having a mentorship opportunity. She did mention that childcare, ECI, and public school linkages could be strengthened maybe in some areas. Um, she also stressed that decreasing job stress is necessary for staff retention. She did also bring up the compensation thing, but her particular needs assessment um, also looked at other factors like decreasing job stress. And finally, she didn't mention this as much, but it was on her slide, so I just wanted to put it up here. Uh, attitudes towards evidence-based best practices vary between the, the three um, uh, workforce member types that she was able to engage. So I wanted to make sure that got up there and that we were all aware of that. With that being said, um, I mentioned how we're looking to engage stakeholder workers, uh, workforce stakeholders, and that we wanna bring back more information for you. Uh, in August. So I have a couple of questions to pose to you. Who should we engage, as in the UT Austin team, to inform the plan strategies around workforce and coalitions? And perhaps you also have some more specific questions that you might want us to pose to these stakeholders. And the reason why I asked that, right, we saw we all saw a data print a very preliminary data. Sometimes more questions come up when you see that type of thing. So I wanted to leave us a space where we could put some of those questions down. So anything comes to mind, I'm looking for these speaking objects again. June. Oh no, Junior, you're not. Junior on mute. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. I thought I had unmuted me, but I hadn't. Thank you. Um, as far as who should we engage, um, 208 participants is a very small group of people. And I'm I'm wondering if we can bump those numbers up. Uh, I think we need to hear from more people who are in the trenches working directly with children and families. So um, staff members, not just directors, but staff members in a variety of early learning programs. So I think we need to really be thinking about, um, you know, the the kinds of programs there are out there. I mean, I work at a lab school, 
um, and there aren't very many lab schools across the state of Texas. Um, and, and we're not typical, but the proprietary centers and their staff need to be heard from. Um, Faith-based programs, uh, part-time programs, it would be great if we could hear from people who provide in-home childcare. <laughs> um, and I know that that's a specific portion of the population, but like, have we heard from Head Start teachers? Have we heard from early Head Start staff? Have we heard from home visitors? Um, I think we really, I, mean, I, I think it's hard, to like figure all of that out, but um, and, and find a way to get people to talk to us. Uh, but I think that's important. Thanks, June. We've got a few stickies up on the board. I think I may have missed one you mentioned, June. Um, I'm not sure home visitors, faith based proprietary centers, like there are a lot of centers in Austin, um, and across the state of Texas, they are businesses, they, they are for profit businesses and the service that they provide is childcare. And I think we need to hear the voices of the not the directors, not the owners, but the people who teach there, the people who provide the care and education for the children. And I'm not sure how to do that. <laughs> um, but I those those are the those people are the backbone of child care in Texas. And those are the people who are working for very low wages. Sometimes they don't get benefits. Um, they need a voice. Thank you, June. I see there's been a couple others that might have been added by somebody. So I see the state homeless coordinator. I see the state foster care liaison. Um, Workforce Development Board staff focused on child care, family service staff. Megan, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I think in addition to focusing on, on who's in the workforce now, um, maybe looking at people who have, have left the, the early childhood intervention, early childhood care and education workforce, um, to try to kind of under, understand what what um, we need to look at in terms of retention strategies. Mm -hmm. And then also on the front end, look at people who are going to be entering the workforce in the coming years in, in that higher education setting or other settings and what they're looking for, you know, in a job and, and kind of looking so we can look at the recruitment side as well. That's great. Reagan, I saw that ice cream scoop. <laughs> So in our pre-read information, one of the comments was, this is not a child care strategic plan, it's an early childhood strategic plan. And so I appreciate when June said, we need to look at all aspects um, of folks in early childhood. I think sometimes child care takes up a lot of the space, but this is this is much bigger and we certainly don't wanna forget that. Great, Becky. You might want to think about the people that work in uh, with Texas Rising Star, the people like the mentors that are going out to the, they're the ones they are helping uh, people in the trenches in these different types of centers. So they could give you a lot of good information, especially if they've been on the job for a while to see the types of things that, that these uh, people out there that the uh, practitioners are struggling with.
So I just want to, oh, Raquel, go ahead. Yeah, and I I want to I want to add to that a little bit, Becky, and 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 just you know kind of be mindful of the fact that less than half of all childcare providers actually are working with TWC to to accept subsidized and scholarships. So I mean I agree that TRS mentors are a a great resource, but how do we tap into that whole other group um, of providers that either you know, choose not to 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 accept scholarships or um, don't need to um, because they have the money and the means to be successful and and trying to to understand those dynamics. So just throwing that out there too. April. Um, I should probably revise my sticky, but workforce development board staff. For me, I feel like workforce development board staff, not even necessarily people in a position where they're focused on implementing childcare programs, but where they're counseling people professionally in terms of what careers they should consider and pursue. And the same and same thing happens kind of in higher education. I think there's a situation where many people in a position to support the workforce, they actually don't feel they can counsel people or into early childhood because they feel there aren't enough opportunities for a long time career there. And I think it's every time I hear their perspective, it helps me think more about what would we have to do to like change that reality. So I think it could be helpful to actually include some people in this stakeholder uh, group who are in a career workforce counseling kind of role, but may not be early childhood focused people. Okay, great. Reagan. Yeah, so building on what April said, I'm, I'm also curious, this whole notion of career pathways, um, early childhood career pathways, and to what extent people who are going into this field are aware of the opportunities, um, you know, to grow their career. Um, and continue working with young children. Do we have that? I know that's men been mentioned a few times. Are we talking about potential students who might go into early childhood or are considering I, it? I think it could be both. I mean, I think we could be talking about, you know, kids in high school who are looking at, at career pathways. I also think you could be looking at, at workers right now in this field um, and, and how they think about opportunities to continue working with young kids. Uh, because I, I come from the childcare world, we all know that the pay isn't high. And I know that childcare providers would love to keep their staff as long as they can. But this notion of having a career pathway, you know, so that Maybe you're working in childcare as you're pursuing your four-year degree. And our, our PDG grant talked a lot about that. How do you build a pipeline starting in high school and working through so that you're continually, continually feeding new workers into the pipeline? And I'm just not sure how, how aware folks are in the field of opportunities that exist. Great. Okay. So we have a, a really good list here. Now, I'm not gonna call anyone out, but we need your help connecting with some stakeholders. And it doesn't necessarily have, maybe you know somebody who knows somebody who could connect us to these stakeholders, but I wanna take two minute, uh, three minutes, I'm gonna put on the clock and I want you to look at this list and really think about that. Is, are there stakeholders on here that you could connect us to? And I want you to circle any ones that you can.
All right. Well, it looks like everybody can connect us to everybody on this list. Fantastic. <laughs> now I need to know who can connect us to who. So anyone you circled, I want you to on this right hand side that it's blank, just identify who you are. So if you circled, I can, you know, connect you with a TSR mentor. You just put your name in, right? And go from there. And so you can either use the sticky note function here, like we have been using, or use the text box function as I just did. And so just know that if you put your name down somewhere next to a stakeholder, I'm going to email you within the next 24 hours and get that started because we only have a month, right? <laughs> and so people are on vacation, they might not be available. So we will we'll work really fast on this. And so just know that you'll be hearing from me pretty soon. And so I thank you all for doing that. And please fill it out as we go. But I do want to be mindful of today's time. And I have a couple of more announcements to make and just we want to wrap up this meeting. So something we're also bringing to the, and I see somebody annotated, sorry, but I'm going to have to get rid of those. annotate function will not go away. So something we're also going to bring to our second meeting is we did a content scan of statewide plans to figure out where other strategies and goals aligned in the statewide plan that are involved in the early learning system. So we we did a pretty comprehensive list of these statewide plans. Um, and you'll get this list right after our meeting. Um, we're going to send out our content scan. We've developed it so that you can see the full view of everybody's strategies and goals. It's it's a spreadsheet. Sorry to those who don't like spreadsheets or spreadsheet, um, uh, you know, adverse, but we promise it's a pretty manageable spreadsheet. You don't have to do anything with it except to read it. And so what we did is because this is a PDG um, grant renewal activity, excuse me, deliverable, we actually mapped out everybody's strategic plans based off of the PDG renewal grants activities. And so if you see a star on here, it is because they some somewhere in the plan that agency or group mentioned one of these activities. And so we saw four major uh, strategy types throughout the wide range of plans we looked at. The first one were inclusion strategies. So that one usually took the form of developing a council of parents and advisory group. Uh, but really, it was about in, involving families in the program development and decision making. And then also there is movement towards expanding services for special or high needs families. The next type of strategy we, strategy we noticed were expansion, expansion strategies. And so those are pretty, that's pretty straightforward, basically expanding the scope or the funding by hiring people or expanding the reach of a program into new areas. And then something that is very in line with what we talked about today, expanding uh, connections to basic and basic needs, right? So that is definitely some, something that is moving within the Texas Early Learning System as well. Our third strategy type we found across plans was improving pre-existing resources like websites, or professional development 
uh, online and off, right? But also that defining career path piece. So refining things, making them more um, clear about what we're talking about or clear about where resources are. And then the final strategy we we found were centralizing strategies. And this is the data, the integrated data system work, and then building partnerships on the state and local level and aligning um, aligning all the major players, right? That interagency collaboration work. Uh, also centralizing eligibility screeners or the readiness screeners that programs might use. And so when I look at these strategy types, that were already in the plans of some of these state agencies, I see that our conversation seems to be very in line with the same type of strategies. So I just want to keep keep that in mind. We'll be bringing this back to our later meetings where we really hone in on actionable strategies. And so I just wanted to make sure you all knew that we have this resource and I'll, I'll be sending out to you at the end of this meeting. And so for our last few minutes, I want to hand it over to Nicole. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Um, so yeah, our final kind of piece that will uh, have you add to the Jamboard um, is one word to describe how you're feeling about our strategic plan journey. As we start this sort of first meeting in our, our journey together um, and thinking about the coming months, um, feel free to either um, say it, you know, uh, put your, your talking item up and, and we can unmute you or add it to the Jamboard. Uh, one word to describe how you're feeling about our, our upcoming journey. Hopeful, positive. Overwhelmed. Optimistic, collaborative, actionable. A good start, but lots of details still to work through. Confused, excited, collaborative, awesome, any others? Daunted, awesome. we're thankful for um, however you're feeling is is uh, perfectly okay. Um, Kate and I have done a lot of strategic planning. Um, with different groups. And I think uh, you need all kinds of energy, right? Even, even some of the energy that might not feel good in, in the moment uh, helps refine and helps cultivate a plan that, um, that can ultimately bring us to a, a good spot, right? Some of the folks that, that might feel more overwhelmed or, or things like that, we definitely want your feedback. Um, but, um, but we also know that sometimes that energy really helps uh, get us to a place of, of refining and um, building, building something that feels reasonable and actionable. So I'll turn it over to Kate now. All right. Well, looks like we've, we've hit the facilitator holy grail and we're going to end <laughs> 10 minutes early. I know Megan needs to 
officially adjourn the meeting, but we thank you all for your time. Uh, as you, as I mentioned several times, you're going to hear from us. So especially if you put the, your name on next to a stakeholder on that jam board, you'll hear from us, but also I'll be sending up, sending out some follow-up right after we get off this call. So thank you everyone for your time and energy towards this work. And I hope you have a good rest of your day. All right, Kate and Nicole, thank you very much. A reminder to the council members, our next meeting is Friday, July 21st from 11 to 1, and it's going to cover the initial findings of the needs assessment as it relates to early childhood coalitions. So let me ask any members if they have any questions. Not seeing any. Okay. Okay. Oh. I have Thank one. Uh, I'm not going to be here. So uh, you had said that I should get a replacement. So do who do I need to email about that, the email of the replacement, so that that person will get a, um, uh, a Zoom invite or whatever? Yes. So Megan Schneider will take care. Mm -hmm. Members, I think you all saw that if you can't be present, you can send someone from your organization um, to listen on your behalf. That way you can, they can debrief you and you can stay updated on everything mm -hmm. that was discussed. So if you can't attend a meeting, let Megan Schneider know. Okay, thank you. Alfarma. Um, Megan Weldon or no, I will be in the June 21st meeting. We will be at the Region 6 Head Start Association Conference in New Orleans. But being that April is here and I work at CLI, I feel comfortable that we'll be okay. All right. Thanks for letting us know, Alfirma. Any other comments from council members? All right. Thanks everyone for joining us. It is 1222 and this council meeting is adjourned. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm.